Hi, uh, I'm Ben uh, Hudson, and I'll be your host and moderator for the next two hours for this session as we explore inequality and air pollution. Air pollution, as we all know, is the largest environmental threat to health in the UK, responsible for 36,000 deaths per year. However, the burden of exposure does not fall equally, and that's what this session will explore. Simply put, inequalities are greater in areas with the poorest air quality. In this first session, we're going to look at positive action. And in the second session, uh, of course one, we will some speakers will share their lived experience of inequality and in air pollution. And hopefully there'll be some positive action there too. This is a Q&A session. So I'd like to remind those watching at home, you can interact with the speakers and ask questions through Slido. If, you're, if you are watching on the Clean Air Day site, specifically on the Clean Air Day live tab, um, you will see this next to the stream. Alternatively, you can join slide.do and enter the code 72733. So to our first session, I'm very pleased to be joined by four excellent speakers and Penny Hosey, writer, editor, and Clean Air adv advocate and organizer of this session, and she will tell us more. Penny? Oh, thank you, Ben, for your kind introduction. Um, and thank you to Emma Hibbert and David for um, generously sharing the session. Um, it seems really um, timely to be discussing environmental justice in relation to air quality at the moment, um, with everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, this, is a, this is a deep injustice and inequality and affects millions of people all around the globe. Um, very vulnerable minority and, and, and minority communities across all areas of life, from the cradle to the grave. Um, we wanted to put this section together on an equal air to give these vulnerable communities a vital and visible voice. Um, I'm delighted that all the speakers in this session and in session two um, are immensely well qualified in all their respective fields. And they're going to present um, in session one, positive, workable solutions and actions um, against, to mitigate against this continued injustice. injustice. Um, so um, I'm really happy that um, Kate Langford and Rosamond Kizzy Deborah are on board to um, discuss the health aspect of air pollution and, and um, in the communities and projects they work in. Um, I'm also pleased that um, Professor John Fairburn will look at policy interventions and Aracelli Camargo has a very important talk on how the built environment and um, the inequality within these environments affects health and people. So um, I suppose we, uh, the real take home message I hope you'll get from this session is that I hope you've been inspired and um, include these deprived communities in your conversations um, and activities moving forward. Thank you. Thanks for giving us this platform. Thank you, Penny. So our first speaker is Kate Langford, Programme Director for Guys and St Thomas Charity and the new 10 year programme on the health effects of air pollution. Guys and St Thomas Charity, I'm sure Kate will tell you, is an independent health foundation focused on addressing health inequalities in the London Borough of Lambeth and Southwark. So I will hand over to Kate. Great, thank you for having me. Um, as Penny said, I think this is so timely and I'm really excited to be such a part of such a great panel. Um, so Rosmond and Professor John Fairburn and Aracelli's work has definitely all inspired um, the work that we're doing here in Lambeth and Southwark. So as Ben said, um, I'm Programme Director at Guys and St. Thomas's Charity. Um, and really in this 10 minutes, I want to tell you a bit about why as a health foundation we're focusing um, and putting investment behind tackling air pollution and particularly its impact on an intersection with other health inequalities and practically what we're hoping to do about it over the next 10 years. Um, as Ben said, this is year one of a 10 year programme, so we're also really, really interested and keen to hear people's ideas of what we should be doing and what types of organisations and programmes we can be funding and supporting here in Lambeth and Southwark. So, um, 
Great. Just going to try and get this slides to move on. Ben, I might need your help. Oh, no, it's happened. Um, so um, as um, as I've said, we Guys and St. Thomas's Charity is an urban health foundation. So we work to tackle the major health challenges affecting people in inner city areas. And we focus on four main issues. So we've been running programs looking at childhood obesity in inner city areas and multiple long-term conditions for three years now. And this is our third program, our program on the health effects of air pollution. And later this year, we're going to launch a program on adolescent mental health. I think the really important thing to highlight here is these are all really sticky, complex health issues. There isn't a single silver bullet for any of them, but they're also air pollution contributes to all of the other issues. So we think it's a major driver of some of the poor health outcomes and health inequalities that we see in our boroughs. Um, and also how much in the patterns of um, ill health that we see, how much where you live determines the health outcomes you have. Um, and I think Ara Shelley will tell us a lot more about that in a second. So we're going to focus most of these sessions on kind of positive ideas for actions. But I just wanted to kind of start with the why. So why are we focused on um, air pollution and health inequalities? Um, so uh, this isn't you. So uh, Professor John Fairman's work has showed this relationship between socioeconomic inequalities and exposure to air pollution for, for two decades now. So there is nothing new about this. Um, but I just wanted to share how it plays out in boroughs like Lambeth and Southwark. So um, this is some work we've been looking at locally. So on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see a map of Lambeth and Southwark. And what we've done here is we've looked at areas where we've got high levels of exposure to air pollution, so particulate matter and NOx, um, but also a high proportion of people who might be more susceptible to the health effects of air pollution. So areas of our boroughs where we've got um, a higher proportion of children, uh, people living with heart and lung conditions, and older people. Um, and for me, this this map is starkly similar to the maps that you'll see in the middle and on the side. So in the middle, we've got a map of the prevalence of childhood obesity at year six um, from across our boroughs. And on the right, you'll see that um, there's a map of median household income. So we think that the communities are most impacted by this issue are those who are also impacted by other health issues and that a key driver of a lot of this is income. Um, and in addition to that, I just want to say some of the kind of things we've observed over the last few months as we've been starting up our programme. So fundamentally, we think that there's a triple inequality. So that those most impacted by air pollution are the least likely to contribute it. So they're less likely to own a car or a wood burner. So those areas that you saw in our map that were highlighted, those are areas with some of the lowest levels of car ownership in the whole entire country. Um, so we think people's health is being impacted on something that they are not individually contributing to. The second is that, um, that those most impacted by air pollution are more likely to be negatively impacted by other determinants of health. So whether that's unemployment, low income, or systemic racism. So we think there's a, a layering effect and Aracelli's work speaks really strongly to, to that kind of layering of um, both socioeconomic, psychosocial and environmental stresses on people's health. And the third, which I think is really important for today's conversation is, our evidence suggests that those most impacted by air pollution are less likely to be involved in decisions to improve air pollution. So we see this in consultation exercises. We see it in who has the kind of time and space to um, campaign on this issue. And so I think how we can involve those people is a key part of the is a key part of this problem. Um, so on to I guess what we can practically do about this. I think um, both John and Rosamond are going to talk um, to the nation, what we can do about this nationally. Um, so I just want to share some ideas about what we're thinking about doing locally. So there's lots that needs to be driven nationally. So um, the Environment Bill is a key upcoming opportunity for us all to influence um, air pollution for decades to come. But I want to share a few things we're thinking about doing locally. Um, 
so the first one is as I said, we see that people from the communities that we're most that are most impacted by air pollution are at the moment less likely to be involved in decisions and consultations related to air pollution. Um, so for us, it's really important that we amplify these voices, that we really listen to people, and that we do deep community research to understand how air pollution active travel intersects with the other challenges people are facing. So I'm really excited that we're working with an organization called the Social Innovation Partnership um, and a set of community researchers who are recruited from the communities most impacted by air pollution to both understand um, pe how people feel about living in these areas, but also to come up with practical solutions. Um, and the other example, which um, we have had nothing to do with, but I just love to share is, and please watch this YouTube video from the Advocacy Academy, which is four young women from South London talking about the impact that air pollution has had on them. And it's the most powerful articulation of inequalities and air pollution that I, that I think I've, I've heard to date. So it's, it's brilliant. I really highly recommend it. But I think it's really key that we, we invest properly in amplifying the voices of those people who are impacted by this issue and involve them in decision making and make them key to driving those decisions. Um, the second is really understanding where people are spending their time and trying to reduce air pollution in those places first. So obviously we want to reduce air pollution across the city, but can we understand where people are spending their time? So where are children in these neighborhoods spending their time um, and, and use that to really drive what types of interventions that we do. So for us, we're gonna be focusing on the neighborhoods that we think are most impacted, which are shown on the map above, but we're also trying to do kind of deep um, research to understand where people um, spend their time, whether it's in nurseries, playgrounds, high streets, and prioritize those areas for intervention first. And the third area is, I think there's lots and lots, there's lots and lots of debate at the moment about um, active travel and how people get around. But residents and how residents get around London is only part of the problem. So there's so much um, air pollution in our city that is driven by businesses and large employers. So in our boroughs, we've seen that construction industry contributes to 25% of particulate matter. So I think in terms of social justice, it's really important that we ask businesses to play their part. And we're gonna hear more later today from GAP's work on with working with businesses as part of their clean air task force. Um, but there's also great local examples that we can look to. So uh, guys at St. Thomas's Hospital, our NHS partners um, have already Consolid, um, consolidated a lot of their freight, which has reduced truck deliveries um, by 90% coming into central London and coming along some of those major roads where we know that there are communities living who are being really negatively impacted by air pollution. So I think there's lots of great examples. What we need to do is to be looking at what can incentivize businesses to take up those examples and to make that more systematic. So those are some of the ways that we're thinking about this locally. Um, as I said at the start, we're really keen to hear people's ideas on how we can improve air quality and particularly how we can do that and reduce health inequalities. So um, please look at our website, please send us your ideas um, and looking forward to hearing from the rest of the speakers today. Thank you, Kate. So I didn't, I didn't remind you, but of course you don't need to be reminded, um, but I can say this to remind our other speakers, um, you'll have 10 minutes each to talk and we will jump in when your time is running low. Um, our next speaker is Aracelli, um, who is a cognitive neuroscientist and co-founder of the Centric Lab, which is a neuroscience lab focusing on understanding how the built environment presents risks for certain health issues and individuals. I'm fascinated to hear more. So over to you, Aricelli. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Kate, for all the awesome shout outs. Oh, cool, it's already on the screen. Um, so I'm Aricelli Camargo. I am one of the scientific leads for the Centric Lab. And all of us in our lab are um, New York scientists. There is um, a colleague of ours that is also on the urban side, which he helps us translate 
the science work into the built environment, which is mainly where we execute our work at the moment. Um, but we are now starting to veer into working in public health because through the research we have uncovered very much that the work that we set out that was going to live within the built environment really is a public health issue and it's very relevant to public health. So we are taking a little bit of a, of a left turn to uh, left turn, sorry, to include um, public health um, organizations. Um, and um, sorry to be an absolute dunce. How do I, how do I get to the next slide? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so this is, I think, an important acknowledgement that the work that we're doing in clean air has to come with an anti-racist or an anti-racism framework. Equally, it has to be an anti-classist framework. Many of the initiatives that we hear that are meta or macro tend to forget the people that are most affected by this. So in the United States, it's BIPOC or Black Indigenous people of color that are more disproportionately affected. And this isn't just in the urban areas, this is also in rural areas as well. And in the UK, of course, it's BAME communities. Um, and what does it mean to be anti-racist? It means that it doesn't matter how you feel on an individual level about racism. If your outputs are racist, then your actions are racist. And that's what we have to reframe when working in public health and working in the built environment, that the decisions that we are making, who we choose to ignore, whose voices we silence, is very much important, is it, sorry, is, is as an important part of the work than the technical sides of it. And also the technical sides of it, how like even how we're looking at data plays a role in anti-racism. So if you are, for example, um, looking at the data and the data may not reflect what is happening on the ground or, or the experiences of people on the ground, which is what is happening in South Hall. And I will let um, those guys tackle that question. But when those voices are ignored and the data may not be supporting yet because it's data doesn't equal lived experience, that's also racist work or classist um, uh, perspective. So we have to be really careful with that. And we also have to acknowledge where the sources of, of air pollution come from. Again, we have to think about it systemically. So it's, um, it's industrial, it's construction, it's soil vapors. Our soil is heavily contaminated by runoffs um, of, of, of various industries. So if you're walking through a, you could be walking through a very lovely green space, but if the water that they're using and the fertilizers that they're using are contaminated or are toxic, you're also breathing that air in. Um, the, of course, automotive uh, vehicles also play a role, um, but as well as materiality, one of the things that we have to also think about is indoor air quality, um, because in areas where there is high levels of air pollution, there's also higher levels of deprivation and poverty, which usually means that the home that a person is in isn't adequate to live in. So it could be that it has poor ventilation. So whatever is happening outdoors is coming indoors. And once it comes into that indoor environment, it can change the chemical composition of, of some of the pollutants and become more toxic in the indoor air. But also you're talking about a smaller cubic space, which means that you are trapping those particulates and you're breathing them in. The second thing to consider is how those toxins that are particles that are coming in from the outside are also combining and interacting with the pollutants inside the home. A lot of these homes are built cheaply, which means cheap, using cheap, unnatural um, uh, materiality, which also has a constant release of, of, of toxins. And so what does that cocktail also look like um, is really important to note. And then the final thing is the materiality as well of the built environment in areas that are have higher levels of air pollution also have a lower uh, um, green space, which means that they have higher levels of concrete and asphalt. Asphalt is incredibly toxic, even without the car on top of it. It still releases air pollution, especially when it collides with heat, because the heat acts as a, as a form of catalyst to, to release more toxins. So in the summertime, 
in the areas in the neighborhoods where there is urban uh, heat uh, index or the urban, uh, what is it, the urban island effect, I should say, the urban island effect is the areas, well, first of all, it's a phenomenon that cities are hotter than the countryside, but it's also micro environments within the city that might be hotter than others. In our data research, um, we have uncovered that the heat, for example, can be up to 15 degrees cooler than areas in Peckham where it's more urbanized. So those, so the people living in those environments are, again, that heat is also colliding with air pollution. So air pollution is something that we have to look at from various lenses, which brings me to my next thing, which is ecological um, viewpoint. An ecological view on health is anti-racist view or is anti-racist uh, work because you're not just looking at the individual, you're looking at the entire system. Both, you're not looking at yourself also as an individual, as a contributor or somebody working in public health to think, how are my actions affecting the rest of the ecosystem? Am I supporting racial capitalism and white supremacy or am I trying to dismantle it? I really do think it's that binary, you're either one or the other. And so, but the same thing happens on the individual receiving it, that we don't just blame the person. We have seen it with COVID that BAME communities, and I say they got blamed because they were told that it was either the vitamin D intake, nope. Um, or they were told that there was something different about their genetics, nope, we are all genetically the same. Um, and if there could be something where they have more prevalence in their communities of diabetes, it's because of the environments that they're living in, specifically air pollution. Air pollution, because it gets into our bloodstream, can change so many different things in our biological systems. We specifically look at the stress response or the HPA access. And what we also find is that insulin, for example, changes, as in the insulin response changes when especially a sorry a child or a person is exposed to air pollution from a very young age so that means that person's ability to metabolize sugars is already changing um so if we then just focus on oh let's just have a sugar tax or let's um, simply get them to eat more vegetables and do that campaign without looking at the environmental ecological system around them, we are doing them a disservice. And not only that, but if we blame them that because they haven't done their five a day or their active walking or whatever it is, it's actually what we think in Centric is that it's immoral. It's immoral to blame the person when they are living in a systemically oppressive environment that doesn't do anything to support their health. Um, so what we want to say uh, from, from that perspective is that air pollution does equal to health poor, uh, sorry, poor health outcomes through a systemic manner. And if we want actually to improve um, health outcomes, especially now that we've, I think, and I hope that we've learned our lesson with COVID that without health, we do not have anything. We do not have culture. We don't have society. We don't have economy. We don't have innovation. So health has to be the ROI. The ROI can no longer be, I'm sorry, but it cannot be money anymore. The ROI has to be health for health's sake, because without it, we do not have anything. We don't have any sense of society. Um, but it does mean that we have to look at this in an, in an ecological view. So if I go to my last slide, we then talk about susceptibility and biological inequality. So it's not only that poor air quality is inequitably distributed across a city like London, i.e. not everybody suffers the peaks, the same peaks and troughs of air pollution. Poor people, poor people of color are disproportionately affected by air pollution. And something that Kate said about the lived experience is super important because every, you can have a neighbor side by side living with both levels, both experiencing, sorry, the same levels of air pollution. But if one neighbor has to also do shift work, which means that their metabolical response again is being challenged because of the shift work that their that their um, their their sleep wake cycle is interrupted, which we, again we know is a contributor to obesity and to diabetes and depression and anxiety. And then that person is going to be more vulnerable, more susceptible to the effects of air pollution at a lower level. Okay, so let me break that down. 
That means that when, and, and by the way, that is called a psychosocial stressor. Um, the, the, the experience of poverty or the experience of an unequal environment. Um, that vulnerability of the psychosocial stressor, of the lived experience, of the different lived experience, is the mediator in the long-term effects of, of air pollution. So children um, and, and adolescents, for example, that have lived through trauma, that have lived through the trauma of poverty regard, uh, because of the different experiences, whether it's um, violence directly or structural violence, which means not having enough food in the home, um, having parents that are unfortunately not able to be there with them because they're trying to sustain them economically, those children are affected by air pollution at much lower levels. So in essence, the body becomes more vulnerable to air pollution when it also is combined with the experience of poverty. Uh, Rachelle, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to cut, stop you there. Um, oh, no worries, no worries. Um, can I just say one last thing is that we just have to get into, move away from data and start looking at action because I think we do all understand that um, air pollution affects us. And sorry, and then that is our urban health uh, um, index where we are asking people to log in, see where you live, um, because knowing where you live and how it affects your health is a human right issue. Thank you, Aricelli. There's so much to um, unpack from just those 10 minutes of you talking. Hopefully there'll be a chance to answer some questions at the end of this session. We have two more speakers coming up. Uh, John, um, uh, he is John Fairburn, Professor of Sustainable Development at Staffordshire University. He has worked on environmental health inequalities and environmental justice for over 20 years, including research for the Environment Agency and the World Health Organization. And he joins us now. Hello, John. You Hi. have your 10 minutes now Thanks. and we'll be able to progress your presentation for you. Thanks very much. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, you can see my details there. I'm on Twitter and uh, very active on there. And there's a lot of stuff going on with clean air day today. Um, if you can advance the slide, please. Um, I wanted to start with um, this, which is the Ostrava Declaration. Um, the Ostrava Declaration was signed by ministers and cover, covers virtually all European countries and some other countries as well. Um, and you, I picked out just two important points for it here. The first is the issue of equity, which, uh, uh, which has just been talked about, and why equity is important. And the second is issues specifically about indoor and outdoor air quality for all. Um, and those are key um, measures that are decided uh, and agreed on at the ministerial level. So if people ask you, why are you doing this? Why are you complaining to me as a politician? You can say, well, you've signed up to this. Our government has signed up to this. Next slide, please. Um, and since that time, we've uh, a group, a large group of experts and stakeholders has been working together. Um, are you still there? We seem to have lost your sound. Can you speak, John? Okay, well, John is having some technical difficulties. <laughs> Um, John, I think if it's okay. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, that's better. Right. Um, as if we move the slide on, so a group of us has been working and one of the outputs we've took, put together is this environmental health inequalities resource package. This is aimed really at anyone who is working in this field at a local or a national level. Um, and particularly it deals with uh, health and health equity issues as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. 
Um, what, what does this involve? It's very practical help that's in this document. Uh, it was pulled together by several of us over a couple of years, uh, and it went out to consultation with a lot of different groups who are working in this area. So if you're a, 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 an NGO or you're a voluntary group and you've got new people coming in and you want to give them something to get them started, then this would be a very good document. We've got things here like the key definitions and glossary, bringing out what is the difference between equality and equity, for example. How do we have different levels of vulnerability? Um, if you move to the next slide, please. Um, we've got a chapter that talks about distributional methods. How do you go about doing distributional studies? Uh, how do you go about doing equity sensitive analysis? Because that is often a very um, important first step that can be taken um, and you can get into a, a procedure of doing this regularly to monitor the effectiveness. So this takes you through a step by step and whether you're a researcher or a local authority person or you're thinking about what to write to your local uh, MPs or politicians about what you'd like them to do, you can have a look at this. Um, next slide, please. Um, we've got a chapter which pulls together lots of different tools and guidance. This is to help people with the procedural aspects. So you've often got evidence or you've gathered evidence that you think there's a problem. How do you go about using that evidence to lobby and to influence policymakers, uh, health authorities, environmental organizations to take some action? Okay, so you can have a, a, a good look through there. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just showing you really a few highlights. There's, there's, you know, the document isn't big. It's very concise, deliberately. Um, we've cut it down as much as possible. One of the key messages, though, key messages we need to be putting out is um, issues around equity. You will often see graphs that show a massive improvement in air pollution over the last 20 years, if you look at the national data. And that's true. There has been a huge improvement in air quality for many people, but not all people. And what we find is that general policies are not effective for all people. We need targeted policies that are going to deal with this equity issue. Um, and so we've got issues in there, uh, messages in there about how you should go about or how you can go about bringing those messages to politicians. Um, next slide, please. Um, Hopefully, I can't see the Zoom, or, so I'm, I'm not seeing this at the moment, but hopefully um, what you're seeing at the moment is a um, Annex 1. Um, and we've laid out here what different actors, different professions can do. And there's a wide range of different people in there. So urban planners, what they can do, academics, what they can do, NGOs, what they can do, citizens, what they can do. Uh, health authorities, what they can do, all laid out for you in an annex to give you some ideas. Um, next slide, please. I think a very important thing I'd like to stress is that the World Health Organization is currently going through a very big review of air quality standards. It's quite some time since the air quality standards have been set, and they're very important standards because they are based solely on health evidence. And governments and the EU, governments around the world, look at those very seriously when they're considering what air quality standards to set. Now, they don't always adopt them. They don't always adopt them because they may say, oh, we've got to consider other things such as the cost, or they may get lobbied against. But this is going on right now. Um, we're not sure when the standards are going to be published. It could even be another year or two. Um, it's almost certainly the case, because I've attended some of these meetings, that the standards will tighten because there is so much health evidence around now about how air quality impacts on people's health in all sorts of ways. Um, it's very likely that they will tighten and governments as you saw earlier in the first, second slide, have signed up to improve air quality. So if you want to do something, lobby governments to adopt the WHO standards when they come to set theirs. That's really important. Um, next slide, please. Um, just a bit of 
Um, there's an event, Public Health England, they've got their annual air conference, uh, annual air quality conference next week. In the morning, we're looking at indoor and outdoor air quality and in the afternoons dealing with climate change. This year it's free because it's online, but you do need to sign up by tomorrow, end of tomorrow. The morning session is specifically looking at vulnerable groups and inequalities. And I'll be talking at that session about the systematic review that I did for the World Health Organization across Europe on air pollution. So if you want to come and see more of that, then sign up by tomorrow. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, I'm fairly sure that Ben and Clean Air Day are going to put this presentation available for you so you'll be able to download it and get the links. I've put together a blog there with the work that's gone on with the World Health Organization over the last couple of years. It's got links to all the resources that have been produced, very useful for anyone working in this field, uh, both the scientific evidence. And there's also a link specifically to the toolkit I've just been talking about uh, to you. So you can download that directly or make it available to everyone. But everything is on the blog if you want. Um, next slide, please. And so this is uh, just contact information, really. But I, if you, particularly if you're on Twitter, if you have a look at my Twitter feed, I've created an air quality list. Um, so it's so, and there's all sorts of people on there. So everything from uh, school groups working at the local level to uh, politicians and international people at the World Health Organization. So you can have a look at that and follow them or subscribe to the list if you want. Um, you'll find a lot of useful information there. If you're interested in any of my publications, because I've been working in this area for so long, uh, you, you've got a link there. And feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn as well. Uh, and we can follow up. So I just finally like to uh, finish my talk by saying thank you very much in particular to Penny Hosey, who pulled together um, a lot of the uh, speakers for this session, and for Ben Hudson for organising this. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That's my alarm going off right on time, despite the technical hitch. Well done for powering through. Um, our next speaker, we have health campaigner and World Health Organization public advocate for public health and air quality, Rosamond Kissy Deborah. She set up the Ella Roberta Family Foundation following the death, tragic death of her daughter, Ella, in 2013 from a rare and severe form of asthma that was exacerbated by London's toxic air. Rosamond. Just need to unmute yourself there. Hi, can you hear me now? Perfect. Uh, yeah, I said, can you give me a warning when I've done nine minutes so you can show the video at the end? Um, yes. Air pollution um, is, for me, is the single greatest threat to the environment. I believe if we clean up the air, then we clean up the environment. And it's really interesting these days when pe people mention COVID and they talk about it in terms of a, pan a pandemic. I would say the same applies to air pollution also. At the moment, COVID has killed over a million people. And just bear this in mind, air pollution actually kills 7 million people each year. So that is the scale of the actual issue we are dealing with. Uh, more people die from air pollution than a HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, all those illnesses actually combined. And now when you look at the tobacco industry, there's 8 million people that die from, from it. But air pollution is fast growing with 7 million. And unless we do something, um, it is actually going to get worse. In the United Kingdom, the figures vary from 36,000 to 40,000 every single year. And to get that again in some context, we've all been watching since March, the figures go up every day of people who are dying from COVID. And I think now it stands over 42,000. So try and think every single year, 40,000 of those people will die from air pollution. And in London, we specifically have a major problem. 
9,000 people die in London every year from air pollution. And it is related to, um, it is related to asthma, heart attacks. I don't think there's been a study out recently in the last three years that I've seen that has not got any links to air pollution. Um, low birth weight, miscarriage, suicide, depression. I could go on and on and on. So that's how important it is that we clean up the air. And the reason why I am particularly interested in this, as Ben said, my, my daughter suffered greatly and she is not the only one. There are two and a half million um, children and young people in London and at least 10% of them have asthma. So that would be about 250,000 children have asthma. Now, I must say, you know, when people talk about asthma, asthma is not a little disease. It varies from mild, moderate to life-threatening. And what is quite sad to also mention is, do you know that most people that die from air pollution, they actually die, they actually have, I'm sorry, from asthma. They actually have mild asthma. And that's because asthma isn't taken seriously. Um, so when people have asthma, they just feel, you know, I can just, you know, squirt my pump and all is going to be okay. Or they, they leave it at home. They don't carry it with them. Um, so these are the reasons. And it's, it still saddens me to say that in London every year, still between eight to 12 children die. Um, and there is no one in the year 2020 who should die from asthma. Asthma is something that you could pre pre prevent um, children from, from dying, but every year still. And I'm afraid it is still going to continue because as we know now, after lockdown, that the air pollution has gone back up. But the good news to actually say here is during lockdown, so it actually shows you that something can be done because during lockdown, no child died from asthma as far as I know, um, all over the UK. So obviously you can see the link with air pollution and asthma. So if the air is cleaned up, lives will actually be, be saved. Now, the situation seems to be getting worse. And I think before lockdown, on average, in the class of 30, uh, between three and four children had asthma. And as I've just mentioned, this is growing. Now, one of the things I do want to mention, I need to take the whole opportunity here is, if you have asthma, every child that has asthma needs to have an asthma plan. Every single child with an asthma diagnosis. You also need to make sure all your medicine is updated and you need to at least have a review once a year. That is very, very important. If, if you find that your asthma inhaler isn't working, then don't wait for the one year review. You need to go and see your GP. But no child should be walking around with asthma without an asthma plan. This is very, very, very important. Now, the other thing also that doctors know, doctors know that children who live on main roads are more likely to have asthma because of the air pollution. So if you map out where children with asthma live, a lot of them live near main roads or they may go to school on a main road. And as we all know, there are issues with main roads, with noise, um, there might be light, hair pollution. And recently during lockdown, we also realized that there is an issue with ozone air pollution. So the hotter, as much as we love hot, hot air, um, we, we, love, we love when it's sunny and it's hot, it also comes with its downsides, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Now, Dr. Grigg has found out that living alongside a busy road carries about the same risk as passively smoking 10 cigarettes a day. So try and imagine that if you live near or on a main road, it is similar to passive smoking 10 cigarettes. Now, this is very, very important because we all know the harm the tobacco has done. And we all know how long it took for people to take that seriously. So this is going to be an ongoing fight. Now, what's also really important is, as we sit here and we talk about this, what I've actually realized is those that contribute the least air pollution seem to be the ones that are exposed the most. 
this is unbelievable. And those that are also impactors, uh, they are also least likely to engage. So as I'm talking, I am very aware of that, that we need to get communities on board to engage. And we need to start asking questions actually now. Who are those being engaged right now? And whose views are we actually listening to? What message are we giving out about this topic? Because it seems asthma deaths don't seem to be going down. It seems air pollution is getting worse, but for some, it is getting better. So why is that? We need to ask all these questions. We claim we, collect, we care that Black Lives Matter. We go out marching, but do they though? These are questions you need to ask yourselves. Now, we always seem to blame everyone else. It is all our problem. I need to do my bit, you need to do your bit, local authorities need to do their bits and governments need to do their bit. And the finger pointing does not help anyone. As we head to winter, I always mention this, we have flu season, we have asthma, and now on top of that, we have COVID. And there seems to be a link that is emerging between COVID and air pollution. There has been lots of talk and I want to come up with some positive messages before I actually end what we can do. We all know now during lockdown, a lot more people cycle, cycled and walked and we need to continue this. We need to make the decisions for ourselves. We all enjoyed the clean air, but it sounds as if we are not prepared to go through the pain for it. I don't think these things are going to come easy. And we need to look at communities again, as, as I said, when it comes to things like cycling. From what I've looked at in different communities, not all of them have access to, um, to cycling. So maybe governments might need to make grants available for them. Now I'm going to end here and I would like to show you a short video that we did for Every Breath Matters to try and show you the extent of the problem um, out there. And Ben is going to kindly um, show the video to you now. We're going to do our best, Rosamond. We may not have the right video, for which I apologise, um, but here we go. What video have you got, of course? Yeah, we've taken this. very stark and hard hitting um, messages in that video and across all of our speakers today. I mean, where do we start asking the questions here? There is so much to unpack and we have 12 minutes left to do that. I think the fairest way to do it is to go through in order of our speakers and give them a question each and maybe two minutes to answer. So we'll turn back to our first speaker. Kate, and um, we'd like to, you know, people have asked um, how, about the lived experience work that you're doing and um, basically how this could be amplified uh, nationally for other people. Yeah, so I think a lot of what the lived experience work that we're doing, and that goes, I mean, we're trying to make it a theme throughout everything that we fund, um, 
I think there is a lot that can be shared and generalized to other parts of the country. So I don't think it should just benefit people living in Lambeth and Southwark. So, I mean, part of it is trying to understand like why do people not engage sometimes with this issue even though it's impacting on them and what would what are the better ways to engage them so some of the things that um we've been thinking about is digital exclusion and you know at a time when we're all relying more on digital platforms and things like commonplace to run consultation exercises through if certain people can't or are less likely to engage with that is that is that good enough so what other ways do we have to engage people especially when you're thinking how do we engage those most impacted by that this issue um so digital exclusion is like one of the things that we're trying to learn about how do we uh, what other forms of kind of consultation there are and also who's the right person to be asking some of these questions i'm really conscious that in a lot of these communities that you know we are we're trying to kind of look at air pollution in that these communities have been asked and consulted about a million different things and quite often they don't see things changing so you know just some of the some of the kind of early insights from the work we're doing with community researchers they're saying yes people know that it's polluted it's not that they don't know it's polluted yes it yes like they're worried about it but actually they don't think that they're going to be listened to and they think they feel neglected. So how can we work with communities to also show that there is progress and that things can be implemented? So I think there's some kind of, you know, it sounds quite techy, but I think there's some, some lessons that we can all learn. And I know there's lots of people across different parts of London doing great work like this. So how can we gather lots of lessons from that? Like the work you've done, Ben, when you were part of LSX, the work that's going on in South Hall, how can we gather lessons about like, how do you engage these, these communities really well? And like, what are the different tools for doing that? Um, and I, I guess the last thing I'd say is like, part of it is also about money. So how can we fund and support um, grassroots campaigners who, who actually represent these communities. And some of that does come down to money because not everyone can do it for free. Not everyone can do it out to, you know, in their spare time, because, you know, some, as I said, these communities that are most impacted by air pollution are often those living on the lowest incomes. So I think part of it is about financial support for kind of grassroots campaigning from these communities themselves. I think that is an excellent segue to my next question. Thank you for that answer, Kate. Uh, so talking about money and investment and return on investment and Araceli, who spoke about return on investment has to be health for health's sake. And I would like to unpack that a bit more um, and hear from you in terms of you know, how, how can we do that? What, what can individuals do to protect themselves in their environments when you know, all of these injustices are around them? Well, I think that's that's exactly my point. It's not down to the individual. We have put too much burden on the people that are already overly burdened. And that is the injustice, right? That we have people who not only have to experience, because one of the, another thing is that experiencing the effects of air pollution is also traumatic. It's a stressor in itself, right? To, to see your child, be sick, to see your child be hospitalized, to see your parent be hospitalized, that that's trauma, right? And so you're asking a person with a system that is physiologically being burdened, but also mentally being burdened by this experience to now also go out and campaign. That is the very definition of injustice. So it is up to public health organizations. It is up to developers. It's about to real estate. It's about the people who cause the injustice to take responsibility, right? We know this from um, the, the Me Too movement. We can't victim blame and therefore we can't burden the victims as well um, to carry this. So that's what I want to be really explicit about the anti-racist work and the ecological work is that we can't expect uh, these communities to, to tackle this alone and that it's not about the individual, but the system itself. Thank you, Araceli, and thank you for putting me back, putting me in my place there and answering that and so eloquently explaining this. So now um, we have a question for John about how health authorities can do more to improve air quality locally. And if you have any examples, that would be great. Yeah, um, yeah, 
improving air quality locally by health authorities, I think they've got to start with, or oh, very useful to start with an evidence base. Um, there are plenty of data sets around so they can start to look at an equity analysis and to really um, identify particular hotspots that may need tackling. Unfortunately, I'd say a lot of the evidence for health authorities is more likely to come from Europe or mainland Europe than it is in the UK. I think there's been a real the poor implementation or failure of implementation of policy in most UK cities um, compared to many in, in Europe. So if you look at what Paris is doing at the moment, Paris is basically trying to get rid of the private car in the city. Um, and one of their biggest arguments for that is it's a minority of people that have got the private car in the city anyway. And we are putting in uh, public transport, we're putting in active transport, but we cannot go on with just polluting these neighbourhoods. Um, so I think I, I would encourage people to look a bit wider um, over to mainland Europe because the problem in Britain fundamentally is that power is so centralized in Parliament and local authorities have very little power and even where they've got power, very little resources. I mean, they've had a 40% cut due to austerity over the last decade. This is why we've been struggling to even deal with COVID because we've undermined local authorities so much. So have a look at what's going on elsewhere. We've got some stuff in the toolkit I've talked to you about. You know, people might chip in and say, oh, but there's great things going on in some places. There are in some places in Britain, maybe, but there's not the substantial transformative environmental change that we need in general in British cities, you know, to give people the choice, the option to walk, to cycle, to get clean, uh, clean buses, free buses, reliable buses, trams, underground, whatever it is we are still, our cities are held hostage by the private car. Thank you, John. I think this is certainly the issue that we have here, that we all, everyone needs to do more, but as well, that is not an equally distributed equation and there's more certain people can do. Um, so Rosamond, finally, for the last two minutes of this session, can we ask you, um, what easy wins are there that can be achieved in local communities? I think the easy wins, Ben, will be things like, as John has mentioned, um, travel. So maybe free travel. There are already rumours going around on, on my screen that the government is trying to get rid of bus travel um, next year for um, young people, which would be catastrophic because we already know people are losing their, their jobs. So to remove free travel will be devastating. And also we talk about walking and cycling, but let's be honest, looking around our communities, parents actually do want their children to cycle, but they feel nervous about it. It's too, it's too dangerous. And I, you know, I continue to be hopeful that these segregated cycle lanes will um, pop up. And also, as we're talking about inequality, not everyone is able to afford something as basic as a bicycle, but we want young people to do this moving forward. And those that come from, so for example, children on free school meals, why can't they get a grant, for instance, to buy a, um, a bicycle? And there does need to be a whole culture, actually, a whole change of, um, thing because we are known in you know in this country as fair as fair weathered cyclists and unless you're completely committed so maybe the way swimming is introduced in schools in year four maybe cycling needs to be introduced and young people need to be encouraged to cycle at a very um young age and the same will go for teenagers because i know there are there are a lot of secondary schools that do have bike racks that's actually empty um, teenagers don't don't cycle but you need to give them incentives because you know if there are any young people watching they're like I'm not going to cycle I bet you if I gave you a, a, an incentive you actually would wouldn't you so give them an incentive and then they will actually do it and I think for me 
the biggest thing, and maybe John, I think it might be John who might have mentioned it, is the WHO targets by the government. They need to be, I need to take every opportunity I can to say they must be enshrined into law. And how about we start the new year with a diesel scrappage scheme? How, how about it? So those are really easy. We need to make things easier. You know, where I live, yeah. the, the, the infrastructure isn't great. So if you want people to change their habits, you need to put things in place. That's it. Thank you, really. thank you Rosamund. <laughs> um, thank you to our four, well, five speakers in this session, Penny, Kate, Aracelli, John, and Rosamund. And I'm sorry, I don't have more time to talk to you more, ask more questions. Um, and have this discussion further. We'll have to have you back another time uh, because there's so much to talk about in this session and so much to learn from all of you. So thank you so much for joining us.